meaning to ask y'all so for me there's sometimes you know you have a, an ideal race plan and i visualize a lot and sometimes i jump in a pool and it's just like well nope like that's not, <laughs> that's not gonna work as soon as i jump in the pool <laughs> and i feel like i'd want to express it in a different way but i also had my he sat on, on the left camera so you can see, so see his tattoos exactly, yeah. and he wore a short sleeve shirt and, and i rolled roll it up yeah. and it, i was yeah. i was i was thinking how can i avoid swimming like, <laughs> what, what if i just what if the boss ran over my foot and i didn't have to swim <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Change World Podcast. We're in Santiago, Chile at the Pan American Games. And we have a very, very special guest, Noah Masco Gomes from Antigua. He is a swimmer, and we're going to learn, Justin and I are going to learn today a little bit about swimming and have a discussion with him on how, I guess, swimming, professional swimming works and how um, these kind of competitions go. So, Noah, thank you for coming on. Um, how the how was your experience at the Pan American Games? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I gotta say, it was quite a memorable experience. Uh, I think we can all say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the politics and, and the competition itself and organization, it was, it was very fun, but um, just another one in the books and I feel like I learned a lot. Uh, this time of year is a tough time for, for swimming. And we talked about it earlier, like track as well. Like a lot of athletes are starting their preseason, so no one's at peak fitness. So I feel like um, I came to this meet a little anxious about how I'd perform, but my coach and I just had to decide that, you know, we're coming here, we're going to do the best we can with what we have and, you know, take it from there. How was the swimming? How'd you compete? Uh, my 200 was, was pretty good. I'm, I'm happy with that. Not great, but season best and it's probably the fastest I've been in the last two years. Give or take. Uh, so that's good. You're supposed to be happy about that, no? I'm, I'm happy, but, you know... Elite athletes never, never really Satisfied. content. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 400 was rough. It's not a write-off, but I flew in the day before. You yeah. guys know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Unfortunate it's, time. It's, it's hard uh, flying 15 plus hours and then jumping in the pool yeah. for the first time. Exactly. And then why, don't you let, why don't you let the people who don't know exactly what happened, like what the time frame was like between... Like when you travel, when you competed in your first race, yeah, and so why left, that wasn't optimal. I left the nineteenth. I left at eight p.m. the nineteenth, which was a Thursday, and then I got into Santiago at three p.m. That sounds right. Yeah, uh, and surprisingly, Halifax and Santiago are in the same time zone, even though they're opposite end of the miles of away. The map, yeah. But yeah, so three flights: Halifax to Montreal. Montreal to Bogota, Bogota to Santiago, uh, at least 15 hours of flight time. And then, yeah, came in, saw Jody and them getting ready for the opening ceremony. <laughs> Said, yo, they gave me my, my accreditation and I, I got ready, got to nap. I, I wasn't able to check out the competition pool. And then the next day, just had to put myself in a mindset to race. And why did you arrive the day before your race? <laughs> <laughs> You want the hundred percent answer? I don't know um, how real we be in this episode. I didn't really have a choice in in, uh, in in my flight. They mm. they sent me an itinerary, and it is what it is. How they, long before the competition did they send you the itinerary? About six days. Yeah, six okay. days before the competition, I got my itinerary, and and you knew you were coming since when? That's actually a, f uh, a funny story because I knew I was selected first week of September. And then two weeks after that, they told me I was not approved. So they're like, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. You're not approved, da 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 And I was like, okay, kind of sucks, but it is what it is. And then I went to my cousin's wedding. Uh, my brother and I drove about 12 hours to Montreal, <laughs> little road trip. And while we're at the wedding, I get a text saying, oh, they did a reselection and Pan Am Aquatics offered you a spot. So, and that was uh, September 30th. Okay. Yeah, so, and what, what are we now, the 20, 20 something? Yeah, yeah 20. Yeah, so I can't. Like three I kinda weeks knew, ago. Yeah, exactly. I knew three weeks ago that I'd come. And then it was just tying up loose ends at that point. Were you in, did you feel like you were in competition shape at that time or? Really and truly, no, but uh, at that point, you just have to start doing things to, to build your confidence and get your momentum going. Like, coach. Um, one thing that really helped me was he said, uh, I didn't take much time off. 
So you said you didn't lose. If anything, you're the same, exactly. Mm-hmm. The same spot you were yeah. when we finished. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of reassuring. Because um, I, I really thought I was just going to bomb this meet. Okay. Um, so to be not too far off my best times with a couple weeks of preparation is not too bad. And it's your first meet of the season? First meet this season, yeah. Yeah, first meet this season. So right after this, you go right back to, what is it, I guess, preseason training in a way, or? No, so my, my school um, up in Canada, they started, they had their first meet the same weekend as my race. So I'd hop into basically dual meet season. Okay. Or like, uh, yeah, like mid-season competitions. I have a weekend off, and then we have a competition in New Brunswick, um, the 7th, like November 7th or something okay. like that. Yeah. How long does the season normally run? For swimming, Canadian like university sport. Or just your season, your season for swimming. Like you said, you just finished. Kind of took a short break. So yeah. when did you? Like really and truly, I, I and feel finish. like I'm living a double life. Okay. Because um, university season, you start training in September, and then the nationals, are, like basically like the equivalent of NCAA champs or something. Okay. Like that. It's called U Sports Championships. Is usually end of February or beginning of March. Mm-hmm. So September to March. But then competing for Antigua and stuff, we have meets all year round. I normally stop swimming August. Okay. July, August. Take a couple weeks off. Start September again. It's not, not so, a very long break. No, and most swimmers, if you ask most swimmers, they swim all year round. May take a week off here and there. but So similar to tennis. Exactly. No. It's all year round. Never really stops. I feel recently in the last couple of years, people have shifted the the mindset on training back in the day i mean if you look at like phelps and them they they would go on four year cycles mm-hmm. for olympics and if you, you hear his interviews he talk about not missing a practice for four years which is absurd and now wow. i think people realized um you can do more quality work instead of quantity mm-hmm. like quality over quantity and uh, they're a bit more specific with their training and and the seasons can be a bit shorter um which uh, which kind of makes the sport more enjoyable for me. Yeah. <laughs> Four years of straight training is a little yeah. rough, and it's, it's hard on, on the mental aspect of the sport. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So coming back to Pan Am now, so you flew in the night before. How did your preparation change, if it changed at all, the day, like the morning of the meet? Because you, you raced at what, 9, like 9.15 9 a.m., yeah. So it so. didn't change too much. My, my, I, ideally, I would, like to, I would have liked to swim the day I got in. So I, when I first... Like, best case scenario, I said, okay, we land at 3. Hopefully, I can swim 5 o'clock. Just swim out. Because after a long day of travel, you'd want to do some easy, like, stretch it. Maybe roll and then just easy swimming. No, like, pace work or anything. Um, and also, just feel the pool. Get to know where the call room and stuff is. Get a cr- crash course mm-hmm. of what's going on. So, what changed when I got in and I realized I couldn't swim was that I would have to do all that in the morning. Yeah. So I woke up about an hour earlier than I would have. Coach recommended that I swim, you know, either do two warm ups, like one warm up, hop out and then hop in again, or an extra long warm up. And I just decided to go with the extra long warm up. Um, what time was your race at nine? Nine eighteen to be specific. And you got to, you got to the pool at what time? We got there at seven. Okay. Yeah. Actually we got there around six Yeah, no, seven, seven. Mm-hmm. We left around six forty, got there at seven and then you know, roll, uh, activation and stuff like that, and then jumped in the pool, swam out. And at that point, you can't really let how you feel affect your mindset. It's too late. For, it's too it's, late to it's change It's too late anything. for that. And when I was younger, I used to... Swimming's a big feel squat. Like, that's why you shave and stuff. It's about feel, like how you feel in the water, if you feel heavy, if you feel high on the water. But um, the older I get, I realize you don't feel great every day. And you just have to perform <laughs> regardless because there days. But no, fun, funny enough, I've had races where I felt terrible in warm up and had best, like, lifetime best performances. And I have days where I felt amazing and All right, completely on, yeah. terrible performances. So, um, I feel like tennis is a similar way too. Like you can warm up and feel great and then not like perform boy, in the yeah. match. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. You can feel when you warm up, you can feel how the ball feels and how you're moving, that sort of stuff, I like f- how your body feels. I feel like with sport, <laughs> To predict what's going to happen in a competition is almost pointless. Exactly. Like you you can't know how you're going to feel and what moment and all no. these things. It's kind of you prepare as best you can and you do the best you can in the moment and what happens, happens, I feel like, oftentimes. 
So that's that's actually interesting because I've been meaning to ask y'all. So for me, there's sometimes, you know, you have a, an ideal race plan and I visualize a lot and sometimes I jump in the pool and it's just like, well, nope, like that's not, <laughs> not going to work. As soon as I jump in the pool, uh-huh. do you ever have uh, like games or matches where you you have a plan and then your opponent kind of just does something unexpected and you're like, well, completely scratched out of the window or you try to stick to that match plan and that, that, that uh, game plan that both, you had set before? Both happen. Um, some Usually, you try to start a match doing your strengths and what you're good at, mm-hmm. but sometimes the other guy's game style or the conditions that day, so like if... I like to use my kicks over wide, but get, get the ball up high on the guy's backhand. But he has a very good backhand return, takes it early. Then that plan is not going to work today. Or if it's cold outside and the balls are kind of like rocks, it's not going to bounce very high. Mm-hmm. It's not an effective serve today. You have to find a new plan. Like you can't, and you can try to do the thing that you always do, but if it's not working and you can't do that forever, you'll just get killed that exactly, day. Exactly, yeah. So you have to kind of think on the fly, as they say. And kind of adjust things to whatever the day brings. But you try as best you can to play to your strengths and, and what works for you on a daily basis. But That's I feel like that less ha- that has less to do with the opponent because I don't think... At this point, there's so much film and so much videos that you can see on opponents. I don't think it's a surprise. Like, you don't play someone and you're surprised by what they're doing. Like, you mm-hmm. kind of have an idea because they also know you more, more likely than not. So yeah. it's more like conditions, like what Justin was saying, that yeah. sort of stuff. Conditions, maybe the speed of the court, speed of the balls, the wind, maybe how you feel or how he's playing. Like what if, what if like Justin said, his backhand is very good, but he's having a bad day on the backhand. Mm. You know, like things like that. But it has less to do, like I don't think opponents really surprise us that often. Well, me at least. Mm. Yeah, you, you tend to know something about the guy you're playing. Um, but I actually wanted to ask you, so we talked about in tennis, there's different surfaces, I guess, different temperatures, different yeah. balls that affects the way the match is played. How different are pools across the world? Like, is a pool a pool and you can swim the same time in any pool or are there are faster pools? Does it matter if the pool is cold, warm? Oh, of like, course, they're definitely fast. So for, I'll break it on. There are three different formats to race in. There's long course, which is an Olympic size 50 meter pool. There's short course, which is a 25-meter pool. And I'll, I'll just put a disclaimer here. The entire world swims those two. Mm-hmm. And then when you get to the States, they swim 25 yards. Which is so smaller? It's smaller. It's shorter. It's faster. It's all underwater. It's a completely different style of swimming. It's fast-paced. What do you um, mean all underwaters? What does that mean? Uh, so swimming, they're, they're four strokes, but they say dolphin kicks. Mm-hmm. When you, you push off the wall, off the dives, and, and off the wall is with streamline. Um, that's like when you're all under the water when you first dive in. Correct. And it's the fastest it's the fastest method of getting through the water. Okay. And there's limitations to it as well. You can only go 15 meters off each wall. So you um, can't just like do it on the whole pool. No, no. Uh, I think it happened back in the day. I'm not too familiar with the history, but people realized that it was fast. And I think there was an Olympics back in like 98 or something where the guy went like, 45 meters, so he didn't even swim. Uh-huh. He went 45 meters, and after a while, like, okay, let's put some limitations to this. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, to tie it back into to different types of pools, there's 25 yards, which is only swim, swum in the States, mostly in uh, NCAA and university, and then there's 25 meters, which is short course, and then 50 meters. Um, because of the turns and push-offs and stuff, the, sh- the shorter pools are you go f- faster and you have faster times. Um, but then also temperature and depth of the pool affects how fast the pool is. Um, the deeper the pool, generally the faster. Um, I think lanes affect the speed too because uh, wake is a big thing. So mm-hmm. it's like outside lane is bad, right? I, I, uh, not anymore. I feel like uh, at the Olympics, they swim, they swim eight in a final but they have two outside lanes that are empty. That are empty. So there's 10 lanes. And, and matter of fact, lately people have been saying that the outside lanes are even better because you have an empty lane that some people hug on to. And okay. there's no wake at all coming from that side. Mm. Um, so before, if, the, if there was no outside lanes, then the water would just be pushed to the side. Exactly. And it would be worse to swim on the outside. Yeah. Uh, 
yo, we need to fix this. Technical uh, difficulties. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> but, I'm going to touch it again. Yeah, I mean, the sport evolves. The sport always evolves, and I'm sure in tennis it always evolves, and, and you guys realize there are things that can make the sport better. But yeah, so I, I'm, I'm guessing back in the day, the, the waves would bounce off the walls and affect the outside lanes, and they found ways to combat that. But um, yeah, a bunch of things affect how fast the pool is. Depth, uh, temperature, colder pools are generally faster. Is there like a range it has to be within? Or it's just wherever you are, they do whatever they no, want? No, there's generally a sweet spot, especially at World Championships and Pan Ams and stuff like that. Um, I don't know the exact temperature. I don't want to just shout out a random number. <laughs> but um, not too cold, not too hot, obviously. Matter of fact, I heard uh, leading up to the competition, the competition pool was very hot. And they were like chucking in bags of ice. Yeah, yeah before weekend? the competition this weekend, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I would know because I landed the night <laughs> <laughs> But they were, they were telling me that the, the warm down pool was proper temperature and the competition pool was just hot because it had a heating system but not a cooling system. Mm. Um, but yeah, just many factors affect. What about indoor versus outdoor? Matters or not at all? Um, it does play a factor because then wind happens. Uh, I've had races where, like, especially in, like, Aruba and stuff like that, I remember... Aruba must be the windiest island in the Caribbean. No, it's, it's bad. Like, Aruba's and, rough. And I, I saw the trees are constantly... Sideways. It's a crazy island because, like, it's I like a desert, a in Aruba, an island, a beach and all kind of... They have all kind of climates going on, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, my splits for my 400 were, like, 29.30, 29.30. So also, and one second is a dif- is a big difference. In exactly, especially if it's consistently one second. So it, clearly, the wind is mm-hmm. a factor. Yeah. Um, is that because wind. of like your arm coming out the water? Like if the wind is blowing against and you're coming over this way or something? Um. Or do I sound? I like would a, say no. No. no, no, no. <laughs> so, no, no. <laughs> like a potato right now. No, 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 no. Cut that out. So, so I'm sure there's some resistance, <laughs> resistance on the way against it, but there's also yeah, yeah. assistance. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It. Yeah. Oh, so no. Dog. Real talk. Big up to Zef, bro. Thank you. How many subjects did you have in CXC? Ten. Not enough. <laughs> Be- <laughs> beauty <laughs> and brains. <laughs> Sus. Go back. <laughs> Pause. Oh, um, <laughs> let's go back to the beginning. Yeah, scratch. How does one fall in love with swimming? You can't. All I know is, growing up, when I have friends who swim or whatever, they have to be up at like 5 o'clock in the morning. It's cold outside. Yeah. They're jumping into oh. a pool. Swimming sucks. And yeah. running sucks. <laughs> yeah. How and does cycling one, sucks. How does one come to the point where they say, you know what? This is what I want to pursue in my life. I want to be a good swimmer. I think it's different for everybody. Um, swimming definitely has a reputation for being one of the tough sports to, to stick with since... Um, it's very demanding. Oh, it's very waking up at 5 a.m. and saying, I'm going to go and jump into a wet, cold pool. Exactly. It's but, not happening. But, like, it's fitness every time. Yeah. It's, it's like, bro. sometimes no, we it's can all aerobic some, stuff, yeah. Sometimes we can hit some serves yeah. or work on some technical stuff, but swimming is just like, it's yeah. like, you're going to go and just get tired That's every day. That's awful. Yeah. And you're just staring at the black line going up and down, but I think... How old were you when you started? 11. Yeah. Okay. So... Late. Late to the sport of swimming. I knew how to swim before. I did lessons. Mm-hmm. But um, I got into the sport of swimming where I learned strokes and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Yo, you were immature. You were immature. You were so immature. Boy. Yeah, at 11. And, uh, <laughs> Look how you throw the man right off his hands, huh? You started at 11. Yeah, and... Um, competitive swimming. Competitive swimming. I think, I f- me personally, to answer your question, I fell in love with the sport because um, it's an individual sport for one. You're completely in control of your, your results. And you um, didn't want to play for West Indies cricket. And I didn't want to play for West Indies cricket. <laughs> simple. <laughs> simple, 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 simple answer. Um, but no, there, there's many aspects. And I think uh, traveling was a big factor. I don't think any other sports could have taken me to the places I went to at that age. Um, Can you give some examples? Uh, from when I was younger, when I started getting yeah, into sure, the game. Yeah, sure, some experience, just for people to know, like, where oh, yeah, was taking Oh, yeah, of course. So, I mean... We were together in Nanjing. Yeah, we didn't even know each I other. I didn't know him. Yeah. I didn't know, but, I mean, I've been to, to Nanjing, China in 2014. That was Youth Olympics. Mm. Um, I think that was my second biggest trip. My first international, like, multiple sports... Um, like, games. Competitions, yeah. Mm. Uh, but before that, 2013 was my first international competition. That was in Barcelona. I was at World Champs, and then uh, 2015 went to Pan Ams, 
uh, in Toronto. I also went to I World Champs in Kazan. I was so mad I missed that year. Were you injured or? No, I just, yeah. Just. Oh. Huh? Why? I don't know. Yeah, tell us, tell us, Where tell did you go? I don't yeah. know. I, oh. I was in school and, you know. You weren't selected. I was not selected. Fair enough. Unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> That's how these things go. So you've been all over. You went, don't brush over this, but you were an Olympian. Yeah, 2016. You have the rings, tattoo rings? I did not, no. Um, I did not get them. Will I, you? I don't think I'd get the rings the way everyone does. I might do something different. It's not basic. No, Sorry. no, no. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I like tattoos. If I get into Clearly. Tattoos, yeah, and I feel like I'd want to express it in a different way, but I also had my He sat on, on the left camera so you could see, so see his tattoos. Exactly, yeah. And he wore a short sleeve shirt. And, and I roll this up, yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and it, he's been cold all week, just so you know. <laughs> Yo, it's been freezing cold and chilly. Except for today. Today was so hot. No, it's been unpredictable. Chilly and chilly. The morning was like 11 degrees, and today we were with towels over our head and watching the game. Yeah, afternoon's been pretty warm, yeah, but then sun the sun beating down. Cold. Night's cold. But, um, yeah, no, I never got the rings. I, uh, I've, for the longest while, I, I had a bit of a, like, imposter syndrome. I felt like I didn't really earn it. And I've had like arguments with my, my family and stuff like that about how much pride I should take in that. And it, it wasn't until I got older that I was really grateful for the opportunity. But explain why. Well, um, I, I'll explain how I qualified. I got a universality spot, which is given to developing countries uh, in the sport. And it's not really a freebie, but it's, um, you're not qualifying the same way someone from the United States would. And for the longest while, I felt like I didn't earn it um, because of that. But also, I'd go to these competitions as a young person, and like, you meet some some pros, and they kind of look at you like the scum of the earth, and it's kind of rough, you know. Like, they, you were people too, and I'm not even bad. I was never one to bother them or like ask for pictures and stuff. I mind my business, but still, just the way they they would talk, and it felt like two separate games. Like even the Olympics yeah. is like, you know, the medalists, and then. All the people I met that weren't medalists, which was quite an eye-opening experience for me because you realize there are people like full-time jobs and they're trying to make it in their sport mm. because it's just not lucrative enough. Like weightlifters, even track athletes and stuff like that I met and they have full-time jobs and they're still trying to pursue this athletic career, but it's just, it's not paying the bills. And um, I think that was one of the biggest lessons from the, from the Olympics is just realizing how much time and effort everybody puts in yeah. regardless of the, the screen time they get or the medals and the accolades and stuff like that. So it took a while for me to, to fully accept that and, and felt like I deserved to go. But How did that affect you preparing like while you were at the games to race? Did it feel like was it a thing that you were enjoying the moment and experiencing it? Or was it, did it really feel like I'm not supposed to be here really? And uh, a little bit of both. Like mm. I, I, I was 16, mind you, so I was pretty young, and I wasn't thinking as much as I do now. Well, 16 at the Olympics is hype. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, no. So like, the, so much going on, you're not able to process it. Um, I think I looked at it as another meet up until people would start texting me, and you know, I remember there's uh people were tweeting and stuff like that, and there was a watch party at the Ladder in Antigua, which is like a big restaurant, and people were sending me pictures of. Um, the TV, like a big screen. I had a big screen and my mom and friends and family, everyone was watching. And that's cool though. When I realized that everyone was going to be watching, that's when I started thinking like, oh, sh like I'm not going to make it to finals. And, or, like, mm. and that's when I started getting in my head. And, and, so a situation and that's supposed to be a celebration, you yeah. actually put more pressure on you. It made you feel... Yeah, like I was, yeah. I, was, I was thinking, how can I avoid swimming? Like, I was, I was like, what if I just, what if the bus ran over my foot and I didn't have to swim? Like, you don't know what, what it's like to have the whole country watch. Like, it was, it was rough, man. Like, but, um, I, I'm sure at that point we had like, what, three, three Olympians? It was like you, CJ, what, we Priscilla, had, like Bailey. Priscilla. No, 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 we had a, we had a relay. Ah, oh, that's right. Taya, four by one. Shaq, Hungry, Miguel, CJ, Baka. No, we had, oh, so you had a decent, a big yeah, size. Yeah, we had okay, well, mostly track athletes, and it was just Samantha and I for swimming. But um, like I don't want to sound all pessimistic. It was a great experience. Like I had so much fun, um, in the pool and outside of the pool. Uh, but I did have a bit of imposter syndrome. Like, did I really deserve to be here? But it wasn't until I got older where I really, you know, just 
was grateful for the experience, regardless of the outcome and regardless yeah. of my like performance and stuff. And I still perform well for a person at that age with um, those circumstances. What so, race did you swim? So I'm the 200. Okay. 200 freestyle. Um, I came fifth in my heat, and I remember on Facebook, people were like, he came fifth in the Olympics. Uh, <laughs> so, you take that he almost right. medal. So, so, <laughs> he's 16, and he's just out of medal contention. So, so um, that also helped with Imagine uh, what's gonna happen in four the pressure, years. you know? That helped with the pressure, because I was like, really and truly, they don't care, and they don't know anything about swimming. Like, yeah. they're just happy to see you A part of the best. games. Exactly. Yeah. So, Did it give you confidence leaving the games after the experience? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I had a hot run after that. Okay. Yeah, up until about 2018, and then that's when, you know, uh, I think that's when my momentum kind of died down. Mm. But from 2014 to 2017, was those were like prime years, you know? Yo, <laughs> what is your pre-race routine like? Because I know tennis players are different than, for example, track and field athletes, because mm-hmm. I've... We're good friends with CJ Green, another uh, Antiguan athlete. Yeah, no, CJ's and I awesome, saw man. CJ at, at the Pan Am Games, I think, yeah, four years ago. We were in, in Lima. And I was watching him warm up. And it's like, there's no way you could even talk to this man right Dialed now. Dialed in. It's impossible to even have a conversation with him. I right sat now. with him. I think I went in the bus. I don't remember if it was Pan Am or CAC game. But I walked in the bus and there was a seat next to him. And I said, I'm not even going to sit there. Don't yeah, buy it. It's yeah. like they're locked in. Don't and it's like a, it's yeah. like a. I don't know, they're in a different zone. Yeah. We don't saying. exist right now. No and one exists. But for tennis players, not really like that. Like the I noticed. I noticed you guys, you guys are joking around. We chill around with each other. Minutes before Maybe the game, Maybe yeah. 10 minutes before you yeah. get into like your own little world. But what's it like for you in particular? And then when you see, let's say, the a lot of the medalists in, in your competitions, how do you see them t- like acting on the day of a race or days leading up? Nah, what, what, good, what are the routines that's like? That's a good question, boss. Um... I think it varies for sure. Yo, hold on, hold on. The man put on a watch for this, or you always had the watch on? I always had the watch on. Okay, my yeah. bad. He lied. My bad. He lied. He went with the watch earlier. No, I had the watch on. Okay. <laughs> and, then the watch, and the watch matched the fit too. <laughs> you know? Oh, and you, uh, where'd you get those Air Forces from? Am I, I didn't see am you. I, am I feet on camera? I didn't see you. Are my feet these? on camera? And you put, are? you put your chain on for this too? Is my chain up? Oh, okay. Why don't you show the credentials real quick for the people? Yeah, with the pins. Limited edition. Should I go to the camera? Or? Yeah, yeah. You want to show your, your government name? Your full government name on the yeah, camera? Yeah, block that, block that. I'm going to be a star one day, bro. They cannot hear you, Justin. The mic is over here. Right. I'll narrate. So those he's showing some pins, which is culture for the, these games, these multi-sport games. Yeah, what um, we do is we trade pins. Exactly. Each delegation normally gets pins, and Wait, it's... Really? <laughs> Just. It's uh, no, hopefully the mic didn't pick that one. Up. <laughs> it's, anyway, yo, let's go back to the question. No, sorry, it's a thing talking to trade about, pins. Yeah, talking about preparation, this podcast is all over the place. I'm sorry, it's my that's fault. fine, man. I love this. It's a conversation. Good, bro. Chill. But I'm, chill. Uh, I'm so chill. Race prep. I'm the most chill. Yeah, talk to me about race prep. Race prep varies. Me personally, I never had a routine because from a young age I went to competitions and. Um, not everything is going to be the same. Like, you come to Pan Ams, you have to be in the ready room 30 minutes before your race, whereas a meet in Antigua, I can just show up behind the blocks and you don't have to check in. So I didn't want to have a strict routine because I didn't want to be thrown off and, you know, worry about, oh, like, I always do this. I always warm up 15 minutes, you know. I didn't want to be limited by external factors. Mm -hmm. Um, as for getting dialed in, I've tried, you know, zoning and music and stuff like that. What works best for me is headphones out. I'm just chilling. Sometimes I talk to, to people in the ready room. Generally, like you guys said in tennis, you know your competition. Um, you've competed with these guys at regional competitions. And sometimes I'm talking, sometimes I'm just chilling. But I like observing. I feed off of the energy as well. So I watch my teammates' races and stuff like that. When I was young, I used to, I used to be convinced that if, this kid did well, I'm going to do well. So, like, that used to really hype me up, and um, I just take it all in. Yo, how is that if they go in and have a horrible performance? But it looks rough. No, it, it looks rough. But Sometimes I've had meets like that where, um, like, one person does bad. I'm like, okay, you know, like, they haven't been the train, you know, and then the next person does bad. <laughs> I'm just like, 
Oh, oh, okay. Like, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one bad, and I'm just like, wow, what's going to happen? But there's no one thing that you do all the time no. before a race? No, nothing strict. Not like I find different seasons, I might pick up something and stick with it for the season. Right. Um, like last season, I was big on rolling. I kind of carried that into this season. Um, seasons before, you know, skip and rope and stuff. It's just whatever. So when you went on that hot streak after Olympics until yeah. 2017 or yeah. 2018, it was all different stuff for three years. Yeah, just winging it. Just winging it. Do you feel like if you had some consistent some way structure. of being, yeah. it might have improved your performance over time? Because I know you're saying that there are different variables, like sometimes it's half an hour here or 15 mm -hmm. minutes in this pool or whatever that is, but there's always certain things that we can't control. Like, I don't know. It can't be that different like the last minute before the race. Like, of course, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, well, first I'll just uh, clarify that. I'm not completely just doing... Like random, okay. random warm ups <laughs> every time, up. you know. <laughs> I'm not doing random warm ups every uh, every meet, but um, I was more alluding to rituals because some people do have rituals mm -hmm. and um, things that they have to do and things that they do religiously. Like I would see folks before the races, like exactly. And like I have a bunch of teammates that you know, like tap the blocks three times, uh, you know, like do a jump, you know, like. Those, those are like uh, ritual, rituals and superstitions mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I, I didn't have that, but okay. um, as for warm-ups, I just stick with the, the program, like the coach program, and I, I always trust my coaches and what they have planned, and, you know. Um, it wasn't until I got to university, my coach now, he, uh, he's more, he wants me to be coach independent instead of coach dependent, which was a huge shift for me. He doesn't want to coach you. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, no, it low key sounds like that. You're not it sounds, coachable. It sounds like that, but it's a you um, problem. To really uh, make you understand what, like where he's coming from, he's never gonna know how I feel. Mm -hmm. He's never gonna know what I'm going through that day. So obviously he's there for guidance and help and stuff like that. I, I, I can always ask him for for support in certain areas, but um, he leaves it up to me on what I need to do that day because. Um, you know, some days your legs feel heavy. Some days uh, um, you're feeling a little tight and you have to loosen up a bit more. And back in the day, I was more like a racehorse. Like, no thoughts. Coach tells me this, I do this. And just execute. Which, in my head, was kind of simpler because I didn't have to think. And a lot of it was just muscle memory. But, you know, you get older and you start thinking more and you're, you're more aware and you're, more, you're not as naive. I feel like being naive is, a, is an advantage in sports and sometimes that's why you see a lot of child prodigies and Olympic gold medalists at 16 years old and then they kind of fall off they start the thinking. next four years because yeah. exactly, <laughs> you start thinking and that's like a next topic I'd want to like transition into about keeping things simple and overthinking like <laughs> does that affect you guys with, with tennis and like for 100%. me there have been races where I'm thinking so much that it's just like I, you, you shouldn't be thinking in a race I, put, I don't think you should be thinking. I'll put this. it to you this way. I I don't know the exact numbers, but they say like in let's say like a three hour tennis match, maybe you're actually hitting tennis balls in a point, maybe like thirty minutes. I mm -hmm. don't know if that's actual numbers, but, but it's a something rough like that. ballpark, yeah. It's like maybe ten percent of the time that you're playing is actual tennis. Mm -hmm. So winning a tennis match is a lot mental. Yeah. How are you handling yourself in between those in between those, let's say, we have 25 seconds in between points, how you manage that time, and then the changeovers and the mm -hmm. set breaks is huge because oftentimes how you react to a mistake or what you take from a point that you won is going to affect the next point mm -hmm. and it's going to stack up over that, over that two or three hours. So I think that's where for tennis players, routines and rituals are actually very important because you don't want to be thinking for for two and a half hours. That's when you, a long when you're time trying to, to stay engaged, yeah. Because being conscious and like producing a stroke is not gonna help you perform well in the moment. Mm -hmm. When you're playing a match, what you should be doing mostly, they say is like thinking in pictures, like you're seeing, you're trying to see the tactics that you wanna play or where you want the ball to go and you wanna just make the decision and do it. You don't right. want to like 
think about how I'm going to hit this ball to make it, you know? Right. Because that's only going to take away from the actual performance. So thinking of tennis is huge. And then, like, all athletes, well, maybe ours is different, but, like, our tournament is over the whole week. So if I'm going to win a tournament, I need to win usually at least five matches in a row. That's a basic round of 32 format, yeah? yeah? Like, this event is a 48, so... The 16 seeds or people who got buys have to win five matches to win the tournament. Mm -hmm. And the thinking usually starts, let's say, a day or two before the tournament starts. And then you have to manage that throughout the whole entire week. And there's like a sort of a, I don't know how everybody else feels, but there is like an in-tournament tension that you hold yeah. in your in your body, no, the best in your leave, mind. The best leave is the day, day after, after you're the done. Tournament I, done. Either you, the win, day you done. win the tournament or you've lost the match. That next night is like you can sleep easy. You just relieve. Yeah, regardless it's a relief. of the outcome. You know, yeah. you know, Noah said to me it's so different tennis to swim in, like in the sense that, which I didn't fully agree with. He said to me that if you start badly in tennis, you have time to work into the match because it's like a full length of the match. Versus swimming is like it's so short, or maybe racing or cycling. It's relative. Know, like, but I feel like what I explained to him is that matches are also won and lost by a handful of points. So yeah. it really yeah. is comes down to these like few moments, and these can go by so fast. Like momentum can go back and forth, but at mm -hmm. the end of the day, like a a close six four six four match. Can it, comes it, down it can to be both. It yeah. can be both. Yeah. I think in tennis, like for me, example for yesterday, I lost the first set quick, but okay, there is time for me to figure it out, mm -hmm. but. Sometimes what also happens is that when the guy gets up well, let's say he's a good front runner, mm -hmm. and, he, and he does. Because there are players who get ahead, and then they start to think. Yeah. But there are also players who get ahead, and the confidence grows. Yeah. So it felt like to me, the guy I played yesterday had no problem with being ahead. Because once I didn't start that well, he didn't give me anything. And he, he was playing, he was playing very aggressive. Yeah. So actually, the pressure felt like it was very much on my side to figure it out. And it had to happen kind of fast, mm -hmm. especially early in the second set. Uh, which I played better, but he never actually ever gave me a dip. You know, that kind of sounds like a swimming race. Like, yeah. you dive in the pool and you don't have a good start, the person's ahead, and now it's up to you to try and catch up. Yeah, to know? find some way to make something shake. I feel like it depends on the rate. Like, okay, so I do middle distance, right? There's not much... If, like, if you miss the start in a, in a 200 free, right? You can st you're still not out of the race, right? But it's... To me, it's, you got some work to do. And then also, you don't want to panic and then Get burn your legs, early. go but all out on the first 50 to try and catch them because we, you still got 150. We watched Blaze left. play today. Right. Right? Blaze played a very poor first set for his level. And he was still and he, and, and he was yeah. down a break in the second. Mm -hmm. But unlike the opponent that I had, you could tell that the guy he was playing... Oh, he was gassed. ...was like tired, yeah. but... He was tired because he was spending so much nervous energy. You heard him grunting loud. Mm. Every, every point he won, he was like excited. So his energy was like... So yeah. you knew that if he played one bad game, he was going to get deflated. Yeah. And if Blaze stayed somewhat normal, the other guy's going to struggle. Exactly. So like, that kind of match, you never feel like you're out of it. You yeah. feel like one bad moment and I can take it. You can swing But if you're playing somebody of a certain quality, that doesn't really exist. Yeah. Like those moments... They don't come, and if they do come, you better take that one because yeah. you're not gonna get two, three, four of those. Chances, exactly. You know what I mean? No, I, so. I think that was interesting because I could notice that, and I, I don't watch tennis a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, I could, I could see that the guy was crumbling under pressure. Mm -hmm. Like I could see he was getting tired, um, yeah. each game. Yeah. And I felt like Blaze was capitalizing on that. Yeah. And you can feed off that energy, like for sure. For me, I feel that, which is why I brought this up to Jody is. Again, last first set, and don't you said he was down a break? Who? Blaze. Blaze. Yeah, he was down a break. So, so you know, in clean assuming, slate. Exactly. Yeah. Y it's still not over. Now, obviously, you still have to think point by point, but like in swimming, it's like, say you have a fifty-three, you miss a start, that's actually it. That's it. No, that's <laughs> it. That's Wait, is there a way to see how the opponent is going to be? Like, if someone dies in the pool, do you have any idea if they're gonna burn out, if they're comfortable? Like, you have. You can't really see your opponent that much, right? Depends, you can feel them, Depends though. on the race, yeah. Depends on the race. Um, sprints, it's really just... Most people 
tend to stay in their own lane. They're, they're races that look. Some people peek underwater and stuff like that. Um, no, I saw firing a, question after question. No, no, it's, rel- it's relevant. I saw a girl switch her... Bre- the, the way she was That breathing. was so yeah. she could see who was exactly. on the right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know that happens? Um, I think sometimes you can feel... You can feel uh, if your pr- your opponent's gonna crack, mm-hmm. and that that but that depends on how well you know your opponent prior to the race. Yeah, I think it's a little different in tennis. Yeah. You need some history. I know some people that um, it also depends on how they race. I know some people that they they go out and they that's that's their race strategy. They tend to go out and hold on. Some people try to like start conservatively and then chase. Mm. so there's some chasers and then there's some like pack leaders and they just hold on um and then there's some people that like if you stick with them long enough and this is more for the longer races distance middle distance if you stick on the hip long enough they might tense up a little Mm. um but i find like what i noticed today in tennis is you can physically see their mannerisms um the way they carry themselves you know if they're, they're hanging their head down low after a point like i think that's that's good intel as a player. It's big. And I'd love to be able to notice those small, it's, small mannerisms because yeah. I swear if I see someone like, I wish there was a way in swimming where you could see someone like, you know, like mm-hmm. sigh, yeah. you yeah. know, because that's it. Um, like that's it. If I know I'm tired, but like that other guy is, mm-hmm. and you don't really see it, but that's what you're trying to convince yourself in your head. There the can be 50, some, they're feeling what I'm feeling. But they're not feeling the way I'm feeling. And there can be some games in tennis too. There can be some like mind games. Like oh, of course. People, people will call the trainer and act like they're hurt or... So I asked Jody this earlier um, if people sandbag and you didn't get the term. But um, the... So in swimming, sometimes, you know, you might swim the heats a little rough. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, most competitions I've been to, heats, finals. Olympics, heats, semifinals and finals. But uh, some people, you know, take it easy in prelims. Some people make it look like they struggled in prelims and then, you know, turn it on in, in the finals. I and I was so. asking if you guys did that in tennis, but like you were saying that some people do act tired. Um, you brought up Andy Murray. He's like cursing, and, but deep down he's, he's dialed. The point. He's yeah. dialed, yeah. So, but it's not, I wouldn't say people play bad on purpose. I mean, there might be times where people might give you a game because let's say they're tired. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they want to change the rhythm of the match. They want to make it feel strange. But I don't think players generally want to stay on the court longer than they have to. Like I doubt, because we have to play the next day and the next day right. and the like next day. I doubt Andy Murray is acting tired so his opponent thinks that he's tired so that he can be... No, but I'm just saying I feel like in that, that it can moment, affect the opponent. The opponent might yeah. be annoyed no. by the fact that he looks tired then he yeah. runs for every ball. But I think that's more for him. I don't think it's that much for the opponent. Like, I think he's trying to... Maybe that's how he feels. Like, if he feels like he's working really hard... And that's how he vents. That's how he gets in the yeah. zone, really. Okay. Like, I don't know if he's doing that because... Oh, if I look tired, then maybe my opponent's going to think I'm tired. And then yeah. I run down 16 balls in this rally. Like, he does it every single match. So, obviously, people know that he's not tired. He still does it. That's so just maybe, the way he is. Maybe he just has yeah. to feel that he's being very physical on the court to perform. Or maybe he's just actually working that hard. I don't yeah. know. I was just saying that to the point where he was saying the body language because it's not always it can be deceiving it can, it be. can be deceiving but I think yeah. I think body language is key like I that kid from from uh, Paraguay or whatever I, I don't think he should have been you know like breathing like that like sometimes who played against Blaze this morning yeah exactly like yeah. when I used to fi- when I was a kid when I used to finish races I'm breathing through my nose Cause you have to like look like uh, like exactly like look it's strong, just heat. Look. I'm bre- I'm hopping out the pool. Even if I'm dead, like I'm hopping out the pool, yeah. breathing through my nose. Now as I got older, I get a little more punky and I like, you know I complain for everything. Okay. Mm-hmm. But um, I think those things affect your opponent because psych- which true, yeah. which true is every player has a story. Yeah. And the longer that you play in matches in the on the tour, people know your story. Mm-hmm. So like, there are guys where people are like, he plays really well, but if you stay long enough he's probably going to give you a chance at some moment. Right. He gets tired. Or... Who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, he, strug- he struggles with self-belief. Or, yeah. or this guy is very good under pressure. Those, or, those or stories he, exist too. Or he's like, he's, he's, uh, he's too critical of himself with mistakes. Yeah, yeah. or 
he gets angry easy if you, I don't know, you, you slow the pace. So, like, before he's going to serve, maybe take a little extra time. Mm -hmm. He'll get mad at you or he'll get mad with the ref. Yeah. So, there are, people have stories and you can kind of mm -hmm. use that to your advantage. Um, so, that's where, for sure, your how you project can actually affect the outcome of the matches. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of it is perception. Like, of course. Because while, while you have this internal struggle going on while you're playing the match, the guy's the same thing too. Yeah. So if, if he can look at the other side of the match and see somebody who's strong and ready to go, it doesn't help him. At the very least, he doesn't help him. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. I like how you mentioned uh, like the mental battle you're going through in your head because mm -hmm. like me personally, the last couple of years, I've sabotaged a lot of my races. Like from the start. Just tap out. Just, yeah, just like mentally tired and i feel like um sometimes i'd visualize so much before the race that i i'm physically tired because i swam the race ten thousand times mm. leading up to the race so um like in your head in my head That's yeah interesting so does that affect you guys sometimes where you're just overthinking too much you just sabotage the way you're playing yes like it's funny like there have been times in my life i'm he would tell, he would say that I'm crazy. I no, you I are work crazy. very hard. I try to take care of every detail. Yeah. I train hard. Like I, I do it. And there have been times in my life, like earlier this year, I came. I was had a long injury at the end of last year. Came back, was playing well, got hurt again, mm -hmm. then came back, and I wanted to play well right away. And I and to do that, I thought I had to take care of every little thing. Yeah. And that wasn't working. All it was doing was making me mad and I was angry all the time and practice off the court. I just wasn't happy. And even my coach was like, You need to go out. Go have some fun. Like relax. Go chill with your family. Yeah. Feel like he had and when I tell him to relax, he don't listen to me. <laughs> oh my coach says to relax, I need to relax. <laughs> like if I don't know him, good this man does the craziest things, brother. Like so if like, he thinks he's a little bit dehydrated, he's putting three elements in the water. <laughs> Like three hydration packets no, in I one water. Like, like, yo, cool out. No, but that's that's something a lot of people don't know about being an athlete. It's like you're thinking about twenty four seven, and even um, even me when I'm on vacation or if I take a break off, guilt. or if I miss a practice, so much guilt. guilt. I can't yeah. rest in peace because I know guilt. like I'm already <laughs> thinking of how hard it's gonna be to get back into shape. Yeah. And for swimming, I don't know about you guys. Swimming is it's a foreign sport. Like, it's a foreign uh, environment for humans mm -hmm. in general. But, like, you take two weeks off, like, you feel heavy. You feel like you can't Tennis swim, is like that too. which is crazy. You could swim. I swam for 12-plus years of my life, 13-plus years. I take three weeks don't off. Feel right. I don't know how to swim. Either. I actually don't know how to swim. <laughs> the worst is how sore you how get. To swim, yeah. The worst is how sore you get. Like, if you take when a break, you stop, and then you yeah. have the first first week, first two it's weeks of tip. doing tennis and fitness. It's like, it hurts so bad. Like, the, the pain is ridiculous how is it on your mental because i hate my life when i'm getting back in the shit i absolutely hate i my like life. it though because i'm not a big part of my life is that i enjoy the training and i enjoy you like the, the process the process of what i feel like it takes to get to where i want to go mm -hmm. so i i actually after a while in vacation like i miss it i want to be training oh, i miss it too but i don't enjoy like the first day you do fitness okay you're tired the fitness is hard and it's painful that's not the worst to me. The worst is like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, when like the second day sauna starts to hit in yeah. after you've just taken a week or two off. But you feel like you're getting better again. It's is a it, nice feeling. Is it frustrating feel... not being able to do what you could have done? Like for me, that's frustrating too. Like say I have a set, I'm two weeks into the season, like three weeks, maybe even a month into the season. And I'm, uh, say we're doing like hundreds on 110 or something like that. And I, I can't make it. That's frustrating to me because I know I could have made like, you know? I don't think I so because the season before. is so long. Yeah. So like you kind of, I mean, and it's not an excuse. I've, I've heard you say this before. and I know it's an issue that you dealt with before. Like you start the season and you used to say like, oh, like I'm the kind of player that I need matches to feel good. I need mm -hmm. matches to feel good. So maybe it's like a, which is, it could be true that some players need with momentum. matches more yeah. like, more like match scenario, match pressure to deal with it. But I think regardless if it's the first couple of tournaments of the season, no one's really panicked. Like, no one's really saying, oh, it's my first tournament of the year, I need to do well. Like, it's, it would be nice to start well, but I like, you, you have... into it. You but have, like, 25 to 30 tournaments. I guess that, that goes to the point I was trying to make before. It's like, some of my best results have come when I'm a little 
more relaxed like because you have no expectations like eat little ice cream the night before the match or yeah. you i mean like you do the things you have to do take care of your body you train properly yeah. but you disconnect from the game a little bit and you let yourself enjoy life also it's not it's not like i don't know i don't think that sport is uh an exact like what do they call it like a formula it's not like you put in th- this much you get out that There's much. There's no right formula. No. The, you know title, I mean? the title for this video is going to be Eat Ice Cream if you want to be a good tennis player. Yeah, if that's what you're preaching here. Yeah. No, that's actually... It's like you don't, get in a, you don't get a trophy for practicing the most. No. Or, you know what I mean? No, at the end of the day, they don't care how you got you to have the to, You need to be able to give yourself what you need to perform well. The, yeah, they and don't that's care it. how you got there. Yeah. As long as you're not doping, of yeah. course. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care how you got there. They don't care yeah. if you're injured. Like that, That's what I realized too with the sport. Someone doesn't care if you're injured. Someone doesn't care if you had a funeral to go to. Someone doesn't care like... At the end of the day, the race happens and the result is the result. So whatever it took to get there doesn't really matter as much. And there's no right formula. Sometimes you're on that day, sometimes you're not. Like today, we have a good friend, Randy. Maybe in the next episode, he recently... Randy's a beast, bro. Recently decided (laughs) that he's going to stop playing tennis at a, I guess, professional level often. He's going to play for his country whenever he's selected. And he's been coaching, doing school and working. And he came to this event, I think, like training for two weeks. Hasn't really played a match in like, maybe the last couple of months. I think he played Davis Cup this summer. Yeah. And almost beat a player top 300 in the world today or top 350 in the world today, which is not and, easy to do. And by outplaying him. Not and by like playing like, very not well. Like, not because yeah. the person's having a bad day. Not yeah. because Randy is like playing lights yeah. out. Like so, Randy was playing within yeah. his level. And... All day, like, he took a bus that was pretty close to his match time. And we were like, yo, you don't have a match today? And he's like, oh, hey, good, bro. He warmed up late. He warmed up late. And then he went to the warm-up court, didn't have balls. Had to walk all the way back to get balls from his coach. He played freely. And he's like, dog, you don't have a, to do, like, a dynamic warm-up, nothing, nothing, nothing. He, he was did. like, He did a little something. Yeah, but he told me, like, he said, I played some matches in my life, bro. Like, I know what I need to do to feel good. So... That thing I used to tell myself about needing a lot of matches to play well, it's probably not true. It's just someone like Randy has figured out what he needs in a short period of time to perform well. I think that's a skill in itself. Yeah. Knowing like how relaxed you need to be for a match. Knowing, or your, how body. It, knowing yeah. your body. Knowing the mental state you like to be in. Knowing who you want to be around before you play. Those things matter. And I think that's a testament to him as a, as a competitor mm-hmm. that he can be underprepared compared to everybody else here in terms of training and everything, facilities, anything, because he hasn't even been playing, really. And he can go out there and put that kind of level on court today. It's like, I don't know. It's a big lesson to athletes that it's not really necessarily all about quantity and crazy quality, all this stuff. It's kind of, you have to know what it takes for you. Yeah. Because everybody's kind of an individual in that way. That's a skill in itself. And if you compare that to Blaze, who is one of his other countrymen who he trains with, like who I mean who he's traveling with, he does probably more than the normal, like he does very long warm ups with his fitness trainer, like Mm -hmm. very long dynamic warm ups. His coach is watching him the whole time, also giving him a lot of feedback, which is also not as common, it's but typical, it's something yeah. that he can handle. Like and it normally, works for him. And it works for him. It's like, been working for him. He's on a, been on a tear yeah. this whole summer. Like So it's funny. Yeah. Like These two guys train together when they're in Jamaica. They grew up together, like playing together at a young age. And they have two completely different preparation styles. And it at, works least, for both of them. at yeah. least at Davis Cup and Pan Am Games, since Randy's retired from professional tennis at least, mm. his performances have been unbelievable. So... Yeah, it just goes to the point that every every player is different, and it not that it doesn't matter, but you have to find the right, uh, I guess, routine for what what like what will give you the best result on the day. Of course, I think confidence is a big thing too. Mm. Like being able to play confidently and being able to play without pressure is a big thing. Like I feel like, have you ever gone through a season or maybe a couple months where you're just on it, like nothing can. Mm. You feel invincible. Nah, bro. You don't. You don't think. Yeah. You like kind of everything's just ha- going your way too. Like <laughs> nah. for me, you I feel, feel on top of the world. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what that feels you just like. like. You just won, you oh, won three true, finals yeah. in a row. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, two, what are you two, two, about? two, two. This is the best. Three finals. Uh, you went to three finals oh, okay, in a row. Yeah, I went to the twenty-five k, two twenty-five. You won to twenty-five and lost the final fifteen. Yeah, yeah, true. I guess that's right. And my experience in those times is like, 
I, I I never thought that much. I just kind of felt it. Like I moments arrived where I felt I need to do this. I did it and I, and I did it. There wasn't any like overthinking, uh, hesitation. Really, you just kind of mm. you do what you feel is right in the moment, and it's the right and it's the right decision. I had um, a I had a coach that said fast swimming is contagious, mm-hmm. and it's like to to simplify that. One, it takes one good race. Hundred percent. It takes one, you know, one good uh, meet, yeah. and that's it. Like you beat somebody that you you hold in high regard, and then you all of a sudden you feel like I belong. That's light work, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're on it after that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Like you guys have that that same uh, kind of feeling. It's also happened. I've had it where people that you train with or people that you view as a pair someone that maybe you see yourself as faster than, better than, or similar to, they start to win, and all of a sudden, you it start to win. It becomes a possibility for yeah, you. Yeah, you start to see it different, right. and you start to do it. Like if he can do it, I can do it too. Yeah. So like, to you? Yeah, of course. That's I, like I, I was telling you, I love Oh, you said the before, teammates yeah. thing. Yeah, so like, true. okay, let me ask you a question. You see how Randy played today? Like, mm-hmm. played up, like phenomenally. If you watch his game, you think that would have affected how you, well, not really, because you don't really train with him, but like, no, but for sure, for me... Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be like, damn, like, look at what, what, what Randy's doing with two weeks of preparation. Wouldn't you get a little... You it, know? it can... I haven't practiced with Randy in a while, so maybe it wouldn't have been as similar. Like, if it happened where, like... Like, say Justin did. Me, or Justin, Justin watch match, Evan, yeah. like, these people I train with all the time. But Randy, for example, I haven't hit the ball with Randy in, in a while. months. For me, it would be less about training with him and more about just how I view him and how close we are. Exactly. And just knowing his game so well to see what he can do with what I know he has, it definitely could give you a boost. And I think it's fun because we're friends, so it's like good energy. Like one person, and you also want well. him to do well too, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm it saying. It feels like, like the like West Indies or Caribbean team here. Exactly. Like the English speaking Caribbean. We, we all go, look we each go other. to each other's matches. Yeah. Like we were all there for Darian's match today. Mm-hmm. Uh, played a tough match with the uh, the Chilean number two seed here. That's one of the best. Yeah. Well, I don't have many, but that was a fantastic game. Yeah, yeah. And Crazy. I can only what imagine. What was your experience like at, at tennis? I loved it. I loved every part. I love watching you play. I love watching you play. Um, especially coming from someone that, you know, I've watched the US Open before. I've watched Wimbledon before, but I didn't come from a tennis family. Mm. Like, I love watching cricket and stuff like that, but I don't follow tennis. Um, you weren't bored? No. I, I, was, I was engaged. Is that because so, you know us and you're friends well, with us? I looked up at Noah. When I was playing, you don't I realize, was like I, shaking. I he was felt, nervous. I'm a, I'm a like a empathetic sports viewer. Or whatever. I'm an empath. Yeah, uh, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm no one. I'm an empath. <laughs> no one's doing this so he doesn't get canceled. Ah shit. But um, nah, bro, I'm feeling. I get anxious for him. Like, like, uh, even say Darian, that like you guys were saying. I'm not gonna know the tennis terms, but mm-hmm. that um, it was like the second to last point in a set. Mm-hmm. And it was Darian serve, yeah. I was like, how the like fuck? 15 all. Like, I just felt frustrated for him because I was like, unlucky. Played, yeah, like, yeah. Or sometimes like he tried to do those drop shots yeah. and it just hits the net. And I'm just like, that doesn't go his way. Like, I want to yeah. scream for him. So I, I was never, I wasn't bored a second. And I even watched like, I don't know Blaze. Like I didn't know Blaze until um Dominos until I came here. But and we started playing dominoes together. But like I, I enjoyed it. And yeah. I guess it does. Knowing you guys affects Helps, it but yeah. like tennis is entertaining to me mm. like, I do like sports but, and I think harder sports swimming me, or tennis swimming I'm biased but <laughs> I, but I will say there are things that you guys have to deal with that we don't have to deal with and vice versa I think it's relative like the umpire vice versa that what? too so like um, but vice versa I think so I'd go back to you're trying to argue look into the talk to the mic though yeah, this man Justin trying to argue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, so I'd go back into things with like races and stuff like that. Um, say you miss your start like that. Okay. Like those, those are things that you don't have to deal with, or you're putting on your suit, your suit rips. Have you ever had to go to a meet and you left your suit? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I left my warm up suit and I had to ask the regent for that. I've, I've left a competition suit. That generally happens at the the smaller competitions. Okay. But no, that's happened before. But like, then, uh, then you say someone had like one racket today, and he had to borrow rackets. Darian, no, Darian is. Darian is <laughs> Darian's yeah, yeah, he had one racket. He no, had two no, 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 not now. here. But I'm saying in the past, like he's done yeah. it before. Uh, yeah. Now like, I've, I've done that. I've seen him forget goggles and stuff. I've seen him yeah. go through a tournament with one racket. Yeah, that's he was string before the match, 
and play. And it's not uncommon for there to be, let's say, a bad stringer yeah. where the racket pops unexpectedly. So he could be, he, he, he could have been in a match and a, sh- and a string could have popped and he would have been screwed. That's it. Yeah. The racket he's using now is not even his rackets. It's Matthew's rackets. Yeah. He like switched because he didn't want to buy rackets and they wouldn't send him rackets so he just switched rackets. And he just wins. <laughs> That's <laughs> rough. But I, no, I think, I think swimming's, um, I think swimming has its challenges. And, uh, have you ever had fun swimming? Yeah, of course. Really? I love, I love competing. Oh, so to go back to this conversation, I wanted to bring up something about when you're talking about um, you liking the process and getting back into shape and getting better. Mm. I like that too, but for the longest while when I was younger, I just liked the competing aspect of mm. it. And that feeling of beating a time and, you know, it's like, it's like an adrenaline rush and you're already looking for the next fix. You're like, I used to be so meticulous with my times and my goals. I used to have a book. I used to write down the time to the splits mm-hmm. and it'd just be like, you live that for four months, six months, a whole year and you achieve that time. It was such a good feeling. So I think I was addicted to that feeling. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was, that was enjoyable. I loved competing. I loved the camaraderie amongst like the the caribbean athletes you have a good race you know you're, you're joking that doesn't really happen in the states as much but you know you, you're running jokes um you go to the after party you're talking about the race you're, you know a little taunting a little you know that's what i feel about this week like it's, n- it's not that often that we have so many caribbean i mean like Together. all of the really good Caribbean players all in the same place. I like seeing so the, the way you guys be, interact with each other. It would it's, be great if we amazing. could do a Davis Cup team with yeah. us. Like us five, six guys. Like yeah. the, Car- the, the Caribbean team. versus like, so like South America. Like right right you mean like the because is. the Caribbean is so small, you guys against so the countries. So there's a competition called Davis Cup where it's basically country versus country. Mm-hmm. It's basically like, I don't know, like the, like one of those cricket World Cups. Yeah. They have like a round robin. And then you play the matches out. Okay. So like, um, it's just basically the best countries in the world go against each other. Mm-hmm. But at some point in the last, I don't know when it started, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they separated. But it used to be like a Caribbean English speaking team. I think it went back and forth. Like they yeah. switched back and forth between, like for example, Antigua played Antigua. Sometimes it was OECS. Sometimes it was like the whole Caribbean. But mm-hmm. like, I feel like because the islands are so small that our region are nev- is never going to have a team where we can go to the world group or whatever. Like, I feel like, for example, Darian took Barbados to group one several times, which is unheard of because um, he just never lost matches. Like, he would win both of his singles matches and then win doubles every single time he played. Like, yeah. Darian has, has a ridiculous record at Davis Cup. But imagine if he didn't just have... I think at the time he only had Hayden to play doubles with when all of the other Beijing guys were too young. Right. Um, but imagine now they have Blaise. Barbados alone has Darian and like two or three other guys that are similar level to maybe like futures level players. And then you have myself who's playing futures and Justin who's playing futures, Blaze, Randy, the Jamaicans. You also have KJ from the Bahamas. There's so many John different Shea. Caribbean players yeah. that if you if we're competing for the five spots on the Davis Cup team and then we put forward our strongest the teams... The best five at that point. Correct. Like we, if we, we can compete with these bigger nations, yeah. Yeah. these tennis nations. I think it level the playing field too because like, when you really think of it in terms of population and in terms of the actual size of our countries, mm-hmm. like it would be fair mm-hmm. for us to go against a USA yeah. or a Canada yeah. or stuff like that. It exactly. Just, it would be more fun for us too. Of course. Yeah. I think it'd be and more we fun get for along. them too. Like, we get along very well. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The English-speaking Caribbean guys are all very close. Like, we're always together yeah. at every tournament we play and that sort of stuff. So, I mean, but I think it, it's, it's so much politics because each island gets funded depending on idea, how, what group they're in. Mm. Like, if I think the higher group you're in in Davis Cup is the more money that you get per year from the ITF, like, as a grant or fund or whatever. So I don't know how that would happen if we're all playing under one flag or one team. Yeah. But, I mean, you see how we are here this That's week. Jokes. Like, I love the environment. And this is one week out of the year. I didn't even like, play tennis. Yeah. I'm just there, like, enjoying myself. You but it's not like this. the team immediately. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's not like this because we all play our individual years. Like, mm-hmm. Justin's going to play on clay. Maybe Blaze right now maybe prefers to play on clay. I don't know. But then Darian prefers hard. I prefer hard. Maybe faster, indoor hard. Pause. That sort of stuff. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> but like we're never in What's a group. <laughs> we're never in a group like this. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it would be nice if we had multiple weeks out of the year where we're where playing. Where you could do that, yeah. Yeah, we we're playing the same same events. But That's good, with that yeah. being said, like Barbados has done very well. Jamaica has also done very well. Like especially recently, Randy and Blaze have been killing it in yeah, Davis Club. Too, so, yeah. which is also nice to see. Like we watch all the matches as mu- as many matches as we can, supporting course, them yeah. too. So. I think traditionally those countries always do well in like all sports. Like I feel like Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, and like the even bigger, the Bahamas, the bigger Caribbean. Like they islands. have a long history of even in swimming. Like I feel like sometimes they're miles ahead of Antigua in in the development in the sport. Mm. And you can look back to like even the '90s and they produce quality athletes from that. And sometimes I always wonder like what did they do differently to get to that stage? Obviously, I think population is a factor. Um, the government is a factor. Yes. The money um, helps. Exactly. The economy Us is a factor. being close yeah. to the U.S. helps often. Yeah. We get to go and see what it's like with the, I guess, better competition a lot of yeah. times. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Y'all ever uh, go to these competitions and meet, like, big, big names and they're just completely not what you thought they'd be? Like, y- do you have early experiences as a kid, like, meeting one of your idols and you're like, boy, this is a punk. Like, this is just... I've been around, let's say, top tennis players and felt like good tennis player, but I wouldn't hang out with this guy. Yeah, like he's not. He looks cool on TV, but in real life, just yeah. yeah. I've had that experience, but I haven't had. I haven't had, let's say, many bad experiences. Like, with, true negative. I yeah. actually have. It's not true. I probably won't say a name, but I've, I've seen a few top, top players actually treat people badly. Yeah. Like be rude to people who are helping them. Yeah, that's or, unfortunate, man. Or rude to, to kids. Yeah. Or, yeah, I've seen I've that I've seen that enough times. Yeah. Like a couple times. Yeah. And that's also why like... Then you also, also see the other one where it's like you expect some guy to be... Stuck a, up. Yeah. And they're just a real chill Andy, person. Andy Murray. Yeah. In the off season, was training with Evan. And he came, he was the last one to come to the courts. And I was just there on a Saturday morning just to watch Evan train. With Andy Murray, and he walked in, said good morning to everybody who was there, like yeah. individually. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Shook my hand. I was just there to watch. Yeah. And he was nice to everyone and spoke to everybody with respect, which I didn't expect. Somebody came and showed a picture of them from the Olympics 2008 that he probably didn't remember the guy. Yeah. But he had a, he talked with the guy for like five minutes. Oh, that's fantastic, so I, man. I didn't expect that from him. Yeah. Because when you see him on TV playing matches, you you see him being how he is, but super, super respectful, super nice. Makes me feel like probably I should be nicer than I am. Yeah. Even. Well, it just goes to show there's more to like life than just sports and like (laughs) these athletes are humans too. Like people people forget that too. People, these are people. For sure. And uh, I think that, uh, that that was hard for me too because I felt like my results always determined who I was as a person. Do you guys ever struggle with that? We talked about this on an earlier episode. You don't watch the podcast or what? You don't watch our clips. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the clip I follow your clips. I follow your clips. I follow your I'll send you the clip yeah. after this episode is done so you can see. But yeah, I mean, especially me and at, at the Futures and at Challenges as well, like sometimes me being one of the lower ranked guys there comes into a tournament. Kind of like what you said, imposter syndrome in mm-hmm. a sense. Like I know that people, they judge you by your ranking and by your ability to play tennis rather mm-hmm. than how you are as a person. Right. And like, for example, I don't know, I won't call names, but there are people here this week that would never say a word to me at tournaments. Yeah. But then because we trade pins at these events, they're coming to me and calling me by first name basis. Yeah. Oh, you know, hey, you, know. Know. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm nice, so I'm not going to be like, oh, exactly. you know, but I just know that if this was two weeks ago at the tournament, they not talking, past, you know, yeah. and like I know who he is, he knows who I am. Maybe we've talked before, or whatever. But like, these are people that maybe I would kind of look at to make eye contact to say hello in the past, and it would be, you know, cold. So, but I, that's fine. I, I feel like maybe that's changed a little bit now. Maybe because of my results, a little bit in doubles, maybe it changes mm-hmm. at some tournaments. But that's why I try not to be that way. Like I try to. Doesn't matter how good of a tennis player you are, you know, you judge the person on the person and rather. Their character, than, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I took lessons from players I look up to. Like when I got to college, it's a player here, Roberto Sid, mm-hmm. my teammate. At the time he became I think he was 
highest like three NCAA. Mm-hmm. I think his highest was maybe like two hundred and twenty in the world, maybe. Mm-hmm. So good tennis player. Struggled with some. He broke his foot like three times. So that's unfortunate. That's crazy. But he's here. He's here now. He's playing well again. Won a tournament recently. Mm-hmm. But being around him, I've never seen him treat somebody who wasn't good at tennis like less of a person. So I felt like I have no reason to do that. If he wouldn't do that, why exactly. would I do that? Or Darian, you know Darian, very yeah. relaxed, laid back. People are people. I mean, there's more to life yeah. than just tennis. When, when we get there's on the court, more to life than some, yeah, exactly. when we get on the court, okay, you you play a match and you and you do what you can to win. Mm-hmm. But outside of the court, yeah, we're humans, and there should be a a minimal level of of respect. Like you don't have to like me, you don't have to get along with me, yeah, but exactly. we should at the very least respect each other. Yeah. And yeah, that's what I that's what I believe at least. I think that's what ruined like to go back. That's what ruined those big competitions for me because like people literally look at. They weren't welcoming. No, yeah. bro. And they look at countries like us, or like the African countries and stuff like. Now, what like, are you doing here? Like animals, bro. Like, <laughs> like you're joking. Yeah. It's and it, it's tough, and that's a lot to deal with as a like a young teenager coming into the sport. So. Um, I guess it's kind of. I guess you guys haven't had that many negative experiences like that, but I will say that you, yeah? I've I've been on the court and heard some some racist remarks towards me before. Yeah, wouldn't be the first time. But I had a pretty bad experience with but all the top players. I I don't know, man. I try not to take things super personally. Mm-hmm. Um, you and, can. The, and the way I am as well, if if I don't like you, I just don't deal with you. Yeah. So it's not like I want them to like me. I, I'm here to do what I do, and I hang with people that I like. And if you don't feel a certain way about me, that's that's your business. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> I'm here because I earned the right to be here. So if that upsets you, then <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's not on you. That's your I problem. Don't know. Yeah, that's your problem. I don't know. That's how I feel about it. All right, what time is it? Jesse's only now coming in. Jesse played at five. Did he win? I don't think it's like so. Nine thirty. Nine thirty. He's only now coming back. Wait, what time do you have to leave? In like thirty minutes. <laughs> we've no. been talking. Well, no, my flight's at one forty. You have to leave early, well, though. We've been talking. Know, yeah. Any last things to cover before we roll, people? Well, I had a lot of fun doing this actually. Yeah. It's better to have a different perspective. Yeah, yeah. we should try and get another sport while we're here. Nah, you should. I you got. This. You got it. Tons to choose. Yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we were at the today we're at the village. Um, I think we'll try and I have a video, so we'll try and include a video of the village. But it's pretty cool. Like we have the cafe, so we have the credentials. This credential Justin showed you. Um, and Should I do a that, gift, the, the the gift bag reveal? I show them what behind the scenes looks like. What, what? What's in the gift bag? What, you have what? the gift bag. Mine's already taken apart. I took mine apart. Yeah, we I have a little I gift could, bag. I could look back in my room. I haven't received mine yet. We have a little gift bag with a keychain. <laughs> no, like show people what it what it's like behind the scenes because they only see the you know like the races and stuff. Like yeah, that, yeah. We have we have a few videos, but to give yeah. you guys an idea, like at the village, um, there's like a huge dining hall where you you get in with your credential and there's a bunch of different booths that you can sit at to get food. Um, we have everything we need here. Laundry, I think you just drop your laundry off down the road. There's a gym. And there's all these buildings with like, so we are in, who else is in our building? I think maybe all the small countries. Bahamas, St. Lucia, Dominique. I think it's mostly Caribbean countries in this yeah. one. But all of the the bigger buildings, there's a bunch of towers, I guess, with all the buildings that have a bunch yeah. of athletes. So it's cool. Like everyone's always wearing their country gear, like this kind of stuff. So you know clearly uh, who is who. And people are walking around with bicycles and skateboards and tennis rackets and all that stuff. So I, I cool. always like, every time I come to these games, I like seeing the speed walkers. <laughs> Speed walkers? You never I've seen never speed walkers? seen just any of those. Bro. Never? No. Are these games? Yeah. yeah. No. Dog, there's a girl from Brazil, just speed walkers, dog. No. What I thought was cool was on the first day, Evan said he saw it too. Like, we were about to go to the opening ceremony. They'd be walking around the whole village. No, we saw a cyclist. Oh. But like cycling on the spot, like they had oh, that from USA? thing. Yes, yeah, the we USA saw person. Yeah, he was right and there. I was like, they're not here to come to no ceremony. They're not coming they're here not for a games. good time. They're, they're coming to reason. medal. You know, like <laughs> you can kind of see those too, like the different athletes. Like some oh, people yeah. are here to do business, and other people, like you can see, it's their first time or whatever. So well, even like the pin trade and stuff. Like some people, this is their fifth games, and they're like, yeah. I don't really trade pins. I just give them nah, away. This is my second pan. I love it. Yeah. So yeah, my thing is almost full. I'm gonna trade more. Uh, yesterday we had lunch together yeah. and we were talking about sports and what he wanted to do after he finished swimming and then he actually told me that he was going to hang it up after next season 
hang up the goggles. Hang up yeah. the goggles. So just talk us through that. Why? Why would you? How old are you now? 24. 24. And you're ready to retire. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's something I thought about a lot in the last two or three years. Mm. Um, I'm going to start by saying um, it, why I'm choosing to retire is it made sense. I'm, finished, I'm finishing school that time. Um, I'm also at an age where I'm eager to get into the workforce, like pursue something else. It, uh, 2024 is next year, so I'm going to try to make Olympics, and, and if not, I'm, I'm happy with where my career has taken me. But um, looking back, I think my role in the sport and what I wanted to achieve shifted. Obviously, you know, you hop into the sport when you're, you're 11, you don't really have expectations, and you gain some momentum, and you might start setting goals. So when I was 13, I started becoming a bit more focused on what I wanted to achieve in the sport. And I definitely had some big goals and some things I wanted to do. Um, but my... I feel like things don't always go the way you want to, to go. Um, obviously, ideally, everyone wants to be like Olympic gold medalist, uh, world championship medalist and stuff like that. And sometimes your progress slows down. People struggle with uh, plateauing and, and not improving as much as they used to. I don't know if you guys are, are, are at that stage in your life, but you guys are like at your peak right now, right? More or less. I think there's more to go. I don't know. If of I'm course, yeah. Yet, so. And don't get me wrong. I feel like there's some left in the tank, which is why I want to give this this last year my all. Sorry. But um, I think. Swimming as a sport is not as lucrative as, as tennis, for one. Not as lucrative as basketball, football. Um, I feel there's a small portion of athletes that make a lot of money, and then the rest, they don't make anything. So the decision for me was a tough decision, but it was also, it just felt right. And I, I really and truly, when I was a kid, I don't think I wanted to make a full career out of it. I knew there was more to life. Than swimming, I knew there's more that I could offer to the world than just swimming. Mm -hmm. It's cool to look back on what I went through and to see where the country is now in in the sport because we have people that are in the NCAA, people that are D1 schools uh, getting scholarships. We have multiple medalists at Carifta. My first ever Carifta, I made one final, and that was the first final everyone anyone made from the country, and I came eighth. I got clapped. It was in it was in Nassau. So my first crypto was in, in Bahamas, and my last crypto ever was in Bahamas. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you start at 11 to 12, and you end 15 to 17, yeah. But it was like a cool full circle moment. But to, to get back to the point, it was, it's cool seeing how much it's developed over the years. And I don't know. I'm happy with what I've done, but I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm being pushed away from the sport. I'm being pulled away from the sport. I'm just, I'm excited to do something else. I like being behind the scenes. I like event management. I like uh, marketing. I like being around sports. I, like we talk, I, I, I'm going to be around sports forever. Um, but I want to pursue a different role these next couple of years that now that I get older because, I don't know, swimming, swimming is very exciting. But um, like I said, I do struggle with my uh, self-esteem and my like actual mood being too closely tied to how I'm performing in, in, in the sport and that's kind of draining sometimes mm -hmm. because like when it's good it's like amazing like, I'm, I'm amazed like you have, you have a, you ever had a good practice and you like you know you have, a, you have a little pep in your step you're walking around mm -hmm. differently like you're talking to people differently Every, everything's funnier of course like everything <laughs> like, like, like sweet like you know like you're better at everything too like how I was swimming affected how I did well in school and stuff like that how I was socializing around my friends I just had a different type of confidence and, and it can be the same but in, in reverse negatively like if I had a rough practice I was it and I had to learn how to detach myself from that but um have you learned? It's a work in progress. Mm. It's a work in progress. I feel like um, I go through highs and lows. There are times where 
I'm like, you know, what? at the end of the day, this doesn't matter. Like the sun still comes up. Like I've had moments where like, I've had like heartbreaking moments where I, like I, I missed a cut or I, 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 I felt like I failed. But like, I look back at that and I kind of laugh. I was like, yo, that felt like the world was going to end. And I don't even think about it now. So I, I like to think about that feeling of realizing that, oh, like life, like I'm fine now and I was worried about this. So anytime I'm anxious about something coming up, I think Your mind in a week so... from this, I'm not even going to be stressed about this. You ever feel like you fail somebody? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. I feel like even trying to qualify for Tokyo, I felt like people wanted it more than I did. And I, I went through this, this a lot of like fighting and just time trial after time trial and competition after competition trying to get these cuts and it, it was so frustrating because so many people believed in me and of course I believed in myself but I feel like they thought I could have done better and they knew I could have done better and I felt like not qualifying was a little tough because so many people wanted it for me and I felt like I let them down but at the end of the day it's weird it's like you're chasing relief as opposed to like a like exactly. Like, feeling, am I truly yeah. happy, or am I just relieved that it's yeah. all happened? You know, like, made it, like because when I finished, <laughs> like when I finished that last time trial, I remember like I just I sighed and it felt amazing and like I was in for a bit, and then um, and then a couple uh, days passed and uh, some faster times were put down and, and and I wasn't you know I wasn't anymore. But regardless of the outcome, I was just happy that I didn't have to deal with that stress anymore. Mm. Um, but I don't want to make it seem like I'm leaving the sport because of that feeling. Yeah. I've learned from that feeling a lot. I've learned a lot from that feeling, but I'm just excited to pursue something else. Long story short. But, um, I feel like my career has definitely shifted. Um, it's like purpose and I'm happy with the way things planned out. Like, like you said, like the, your, your role just gets different now in the sport of swimming of and you're obviously still passionate about swimming so that's just going to enhance that role even more yeah exactly which is cool like we've talked about it a million times about how we believe sports in antigua should be run and sports in the caribbean should be run yeah so we've had com conversations about like how we can improve sports in, in the caribbean exactly and there's, there's so much like it's to me it starts with very simple changes that makes a huge difference so i am actually very excited for 10 years from now, 15 years from now, to see where Antiguan sports could be with people like you, people like Stefano, people like just CJ, Priscilla, like other former athletes that have gone through the process that knows what it takes to, to I guess, build high-performing athletes. Mm -hmm. And even even if it's not like professional athletes, just, just the sports as a whole, like just creating communities that have like their own little systems of like clubs and mm -hmm. competitions and stuff at, throughout all levels. Because I feel like that's something that's lacking in Antigua right now. Like, I feel like some of the other islands do it much better than we do. Of course. So it would be nice for us 10 15, minutes, 10, 15 years from now to see what we can do to impact uh caribbean like antique athletes and caribbean athletes so i'm excited for that no definitely i think there's a lot of potential i think we as a region have a lot to offer and historically and culturally we don't view sports in the same way that other people view sports and like sports is sports can do a lot for people like sports has done a lot for me and i feel like i would want to find a way to make it easier for people like us to, to make right. it to these stages and stuff like that and enjoy that's it that's exactly well, how know? I see that like I see it in the way that to make it as easy as possible for someone to be successful exactly and they make already, it fun too because they already have so much adversity like we already have so much adversity on our own the, the things that we can control or that the system like a, a system that we can control needs to be as easy as possible so mm -hmm. that we don't have to worry about external factors so that when we come to competition, we just play. Exactly. Or when we have training blocks, we just train. Or when we travel, we just have to travel. You know, like it doesn't have to no be... Confusion. Exactly. Yeah, no confusion. Exactly. No confusion, no... It's, it's time-consuming and it's also, I guess, a little bit draining. It's mentally and, draining to be dealing with those sort of things. It's so, I, I just feel there's a lot to be learned and a lot to be improved upon. And I'm excited for people like you 
to get into that part of the of the sport as well. So, the bigger picture. There's more to life than swimming, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, man. Like, I'm just excited to to reach that next level. And I like I, like, how do you guys feel about your your next? I know you're you're very into it right now, and I f- I think that's amazing. And I bro, like, I'm happy that it's it's uh, like things are piecing together for you guys. Right yeah. Now. Um. After tennis, is we talking about? Or like, what did say? What are the next five years look like for you? Like, cause you guys are, you guys are, you guys have some momentum right now. Yeah, the next five years, for me, I I want to become one of the best players in the world. I want to mm. be playing in the biggest tournaments in the world. I want to be in Olympic games. Mm. I want to be playing Grand Slams. These things, and. What I didn't see coming, pause, was this podcast. Um, That's a new avenue. Which I've actually enjoyed doing mm-hmm. a lot. Um, I think it's great that you guys are showing a different side of sports because a lot of people think it's just like, yeah. it's one thing and you guys are bringing a lot of these other uh, aspects that athletes deal with to life. For sure. Yeah. And I think also now that we're reaching out into different sports and then maybe eventually into different industries, yeah. who knows, but I didn't see this in my in my future at all. I didn't really see myself as a talker. Like I think we have good talks on our own, but I never saw myself as somebody who'd be in front of a camera. Yeah. But I've enjoyed the process. People seem to like it, and I would like to see where it, where it can go. And I I hope as we grow in our careers and we reach new heights, this thing can come with us, and we can kind of just see where it goes and. For me, eventually, I mean, I really, I really like to go home and give back and, and play with the younger kids and be an inspiration in a sense. But like you guys said, I, I would like to, whether it's individual young people who I can help bring up into high-level sport or if it's... Uh, a system on a whole. I don't know. I don't know how political I am. Mm-hmm. How much patience I have for, you Ministry know, of, ministries of, uh, and, and <laughs> the kind of characters that you meet who are in these positions is a lot of times is is heartbreaking. Even it's like it's not about you. You know, you you, you come to these games and you almost feel like the athletes can be an afterthought yeah. in some countries, yeah. no which doubt. is sad which is sad and I think that it's actually wrong. I think, like you said, we should come here and we should, it should be catered towards the athlete to have the best possible experience so they can perform at their best. I shouldn't be worrying about gear and welcoming packages and I don't know how I'm going to get from A to B. That should bus be... Bus schedules. Bus yeah, schedules. Um, how I'm going to get courts. I shouldn't worry about any of that. I should show up Focus on my tennis. I see you here too. And, and compete. To play you know? tennis. You should show up. Yeah. Have days to swim. <laughs> get used to the pool. Give your best effort and compete. Do your best for the country that you're here to represent. Um, I don't know how well personally I would do in that position to have to, yeah, politic and all this stuff. But I see myself, I guess, beyond five years from now, trying to, I don't know. Whether if it's just bringing people into certain sports or helping someone who's trying to pursue it get to another level, but I definitely see myself trying to make an impact on the lives of some young athletes in the future. But I don't know how I'm gonna do it. But you'll figure that's it a over. part of what I want to do at some yeah, point. Yeah. That's sure. nice, man. Regardless how the next year goes for you, you know, like before your retirement, I want to say that I'm proud of you of what you did. Like, just being an Olympian already, like, how many people in the world get to say that they're an Olympian, regardless of how you felt at the time. Like, I'm sure you're going to look back at it with fond memories. You had an event with um, Usain Bolt, dog. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to hear a story time. It's a story time. Uh, it's a story after this podcast. It's a story time. But, um, I, yeah, I, I, met, I met them. Yeah. We're going to go viral or what? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, oh, I just want to say, I don't know how often people tell you this, but I'm proud of you, how you... How you've conducted yourself also you're like a model professional for for people back home like i've heard how you talk and how you train and that sort of stuff and i've enjoyed supporting you as much as i can 
the little I know about swimming. So I don't know if you heard enough, but I hope the next year goes well for you, like before your retirement. And like I said, I'm excited for how it will be, um, for how you will impact Antiguan sports and Antiguan swimming after your career is done. Appreciate that, man. You're welcome. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, yeah. man. All right. Um, Much love and respect. Thank Thank you for coming on. That's it for today, everyone. Um, Thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, the episode with Noah. Um, If you haven't gotten a pro stringer yet, get one. Get a pro stringer. Um, Use changeover when checking out on the website. $100 Um, Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube. We're trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. Um, And share it with anyone who you think would enjoy what we're talking about here. Thank you for coming and see you in the next episode. Well, uh, let them know if I make my flight. <laughs> <laughs>